Good morning and good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. Um, we're so happy to be here with you today. This is our this is part of our monthly webinar series that we started doing in the fall of this year. It's also the last one for the year, so it's pretty special, pretty big for us. Um, we are going to focus our conversation today on NENA standards, really addressing the address points and boundaries for Next Generation 911. But before we get into that, uh, let's go through some house cleaning. I want to let you guys know that this webinar is being recorded. We take all of the webinars and all the content that we record and we do a replay through our YouTube channel. So check out our YouTube channel, Datamark GIS. Uh, just search for that at YouTube if you want to see all of the content that we've produced throughout the year. You can go find it there. And this will be there as soon as we get done with it, in case you want to go back and reference anything. Also, want to let you guys know that we encourage feedback. So if you have questions throughout, please use the chat window or the Q&A and let us know what your questions are. We like to address the questions when we're on the topic that the question, question is referencing so that we keep it in reference. There's a lot of referencing in that statement, but I hope it made sense. We'll also have some time at the end to take additional questions or to go back and talk in more depth about something that you feel like we need to throughout. Um, all right, Mark, so with that, let's jump right into it. And we're going to start with introductions. So hey, guys, my name is Drew Fiorinelli. I'm one of the public safety GIS experts with Datamark. A uh, little bit about my background. I come, I built my career in local government, so I have 13 plus years, uh, really working everything you could possibly be as a GIS person in local government. I've been a one-man shop. I've been fortunate enough to have staff. Whatever it is, I've done it, right? I'm the former GIS director for Fauquier County, Virginia, and I dare you to say Fauquier three times really fast in front of people. That's a lot of fun. I'm currently the president of the Geospatial Information Technology Association, which is a global nonprofit who's focused on educating, connecting, and advocating for GIS professionals in the GIS community. I'm also a former volunteer firefighter from Bolivar County, Mississippi, which is my home state. And I brought with me today my good friend and colleague, Mark Whitby. Mark, you want to give us a little introduction? Sure thing. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here with Drew and I. Uh, my name is Mark Whitby, and I'm a public safety subject matter expert with Datamark. I spent 21 years of my career in the PSAP, started as a call taker, worked my way up all the way to 911 director, and then I moved over to the administrative side. So I spent 10 years working with MSAGs, alleys, and started getting more involved with GIS, with address points and boundaries and road center lines. I've uh, been an ABCO NINA member for many, many years, and I'm active in different NINA work groups, which is really good because the standards and information documents that we're going to be talking about and requirements, NINA needs people like us to be on these work groups to help forward all this knowledge and experience into standards for people who maybe don't know a lot about GIS or are fairly new in GIS or in public safety. So let's talk about our agenda, what we're going to talk about during our, our time together today. We're going to focus on the site structure address point document from NINA. We're going to go into the CLDXF or the Civic Location Data Exchange Format document. We're going to talk about what layers are required in GIS for NextGen. We're going to talk about GIS data validations and why are they important. And then we're going to end up with data maintenance. It's always good to build your data out and synchronize your data and have this really good data set. But if we don't maintain it, then we got to start all over. We don't want to do that. So let's talk about address numbers. Nina recommends that you should have an address point every 5.28 feet. Okay, in some more rural areas, it may be 50.28 feet. But this allows up to 1,000 unique numbered addresses per every mile of roadway. So as a responder, if you tell an emergency provider like a police officer or sheriff's deputy, fire truck or EMS, that this is the address you're looking for in Alpine Lane, they know it's a half a mile down the road because the address is 500 Alpine Lane. So it does make it easier for the responders as well as the dispatchers. So the site structure address point document is an informational document from Nina. And I was very fortunate to be on this work group with some really, really smart people, much smarter than I was, but I learned a lot. And some of the things that are in this document, for example, 
62 pages of information. It's a lot of good stuff, okay? But it talks about point placement, it talks about multiple points, so multi structures, uh, like sub addressing, those kind of things. It talks about address points versus access points, a little bit different. It talks about address ranges, so actual ranges versus what they call potential. So your street may have, okay, like 100 to 200 is your range, but your first house number doesn't start to 104 and only goes up to 184. So you have an actual range versus a potential. It talks about calculated placement, manual placement, all kinds of really good things for you to decide in your communities, okay, what's gonna work for us? Because some places like where I worked in Pinellas County, we had 24 addressing authorities and we were the 911 center for all those addressing authorities. So we talked about things like, okay, do we wanna use actual ranges? Uh, where do we put the address point? Do you put it in the middle of the parcel? Do you put it on the entrance to the house? Do you put it on the building footprint and this is the center of the house? So then you can kind of decide, this is my workflow and these are my policies. Hey, Mark, um, yes. because that information and the information we're getting into is from an informational document, let's take a second and kind of break down the difference between a NINA standard and information that comes out of a NINA informational document. Okay, an informational document, it's not a you shall do this, you, you know, you may do this, that kind of thing, uh, where the standards kind of go along with those and really make the recommendations for the providers that are going to use the ECRF and the LVF and the spatial interface. Those are more standards for someone who's developing it, creating a system. The information is more for us to say, hey, what's our best practice going to be? What's going to work good for our workflow? And then there are some NINA requirement documents. These are required things, kind of like some of the uh, standards talk about what's a mandatory field, what's an optional, what's conditional. Right. So along those same kind of lines, and we're going to talk about some of those mandatory, conditional, and optional ones as well later on today. Awesome. And if you want, we actually got our first question in, if you want to take it. Fire away. Perfect. Um, so how do you find cohesion between multiple addressing authorities and what tools or strategies did you use? It was an, it was an adventure. <laughs> it's kind of like the Navy. It's not just the job, it's an adventure. Absolutely. My, my biggest thing was I talked to these people like via email or phone, but I never got to meet them face to face. So we pulled together an addressing authority group and we met every quarter. So our first meeting we held, we invited all the municipalities and I took them on a tour of the 911 center because they'd never seen it. And I said, these are your addresses in action. Mm -hmm. So if you don't give me an address or say you build a new subdivision, but forget to give it to 911, how is your fire department gonna find it? How is your police department gonna find it? And they were like, oh. So it started really clicking in the heads. And we started putting together these groups. And as we met, we started talking about, you know what? I have a question for the property appraiser. And I'm like, why don't we invite them to our meeting? And then we started talking about postal service. And I said, let's invite them to the meeting. And then we started, our group started growing. And we invited the school board because we found out the school board had some really good data when it comes to road center lines and addressing because they have to figure out where do the bus stops, where are the bus stops in the county? And how many kids are gonna get on this bus and go to this school versus how many kids are gonna get on this bus and go to a different school? So it was really a really good process and those meetings have continued on. So it's been really good. So good question, good question. So when it comes to address point placement, there's different methodologies. So you can geocode from the road center line. So Drew's going to talk a little bit about fish bones a little bit later. You can put it in a site. So in other words, you have a really big parcel that's a college campus or maybe a military base or a large business complex. So you put one address point in the center of those buildings. Well, could that be problematic for responders? Yeah, which building do we need to go to? If it's a college campus and there's all these different dorms and a gymnasium and an auditorium and an administrative office and the cafeteria, shouldn't we have sub addresses or each building have a separate address? 
Uh, sometimes we can do parcel placement. So, and that's what I used to do in Pinellas County when I got the address first, I would put the address in the centroid of the parcel. And then we had someone else that would use the building footprints and actually put it on top of the building based on that footprint when they drew the footprint for that new subdivision. So you can put it structure-based. So maybe you have a barn or a separate building in the back that uses power, right? Maybe it's a uh, workshop or, you know, they house animals and they have power and they have electricity and they have internet. Everybody needs internet now, right? You need a Wi-Fi spot, um, but you need a separate address for that. Maybe they get deliveries there or they get mail there or they could have an accident and that's where responders need to go. Some places put it on the front door of the structure. So that's the almost like an access point for the, for the structure. And some places will use it as property addresses or property access, I should say. Right. So say, for example, you live in a pretty um, condensed area, right? Maybe you put it on the front door of the structure or the top of the house. Okay. Well, what if you live in a rural area and it's a 15 acre parcel and the house is in the very, very back one acre and it's surrounded by trees? Maybe you put an address point on the structure and then another point for the access. That's where the responders need to go, especially if you're using vehicle routing or AVL is always helpful. All right. Mark, and then we've got some questions coming in related to these points and point placement. Okay. Uh, first question is, how do you deal with bridges, mile markers, railroad crossings, et cetera? And do you sign them as an address or do you sign them addresses? And then within the CAD system, how do you make sure the telecommunicator, the dispatcher picks the right one, the right bridge or the right file marker, right? So is, is there a way to distinguish between the two in your uh, A lot of places will use address points for all kinds of things, mile markers for bridge access. Uh, maybe they have to access from underneath the bridge. Uh, some places will use like traffic cameras will get addresses. Mm -hmm. um, so it all depends. Uh, but training is a big thing, especially for the dispatchers because you may have a layer that is like mile markers and maybe they can turn on and off that mile marker layer when they need it. Same thing with a bridge layer, they could do it that way. If they don't use traffic cameras all the time and they only need it at certain times when it's being maintained or uh, a detective or an officer needs access to that, you know, what's the address so I can contact the provider to get a copy of the video for that accident or vehicle pursuit. So you can use it as a layer. Some places use property access as a layer. So they, don't, they only have the address point on the house, but when they need that layer, they turn it on and off. So training for the dispatchers is important because the dispatchers have to know a lot of stuff. So if you put so much on the map that they can't use it, they're probably not gonna use it. And what's really important to point out in Mark's statement is the, the, the notion of using multiple layers to identify point layers, right? So you have your structure address point layer, and I'm gonna address a question here. Um, what do you use to draw building footprints um, with that? So for building footprints, I typically would use a polygon within my Esri platform. Um, if you're uh, an, Esri, an Esri user or have an Esri shop, um, polygon layer, and then I would attribute it similar to my address points. Um, but also um, identify where it makes sense to create a separate address point layer for something that's, um, I want to call it a non-dispatchable location, so you're not getting mail, but it is a place that you would dispatch emergency services, like an on-ramp or an off-ramp, or a cell phone tower, or a bridge, right? Um, some, some of your localities may have addressing standards that will cover that. If not, you may want to consider developing a standard on how you would address uh, a non-habitable structure or non-habitable location. Um, we see it oftentimes with trailheads or with um, ramps into lakes and rivers, um, as well as with um, like playgrounds or, or recreational facilities. Right, you could have like a ball field or a soccer field or something in a park. Yep, good point. Absolutely. And then. Um, with next, Mark, this is a good question for you now. It's not really related to addressing, but 
it could help us with other pieces of this conversation. Um, is next gen 911, indoor 911, a full 3D GIS editing environment? Um, <laughs> great question. That's super great. Um, Ugh, I'll say no right now. Um, the ability to edit in a 3D space is not something that I've ever done. Um, I know there are still requirements, recommendations, and standards being worked out for Z values as it relates to 911. Uh, and then indoor mapping is something that's really over the past couple of years started to pick up a lot of steam. Um, so the connection between indoor mapping and 911, I don't know if it's quite there yet. Um, it's a great question, though, because it does it is going to force us to think how we look at things internal to structures and how we may edit or build data off something that's in a facility. Uh, so great question. Mm -hmm. And then um, how do you address highway on ramps and off ramps or naming them? You've probably done this before. Some places have used like overpass, underpass. Uh, frontage roads, a lot of times they'll have frontage roads that come off, or they'll call it a ramp northbound, a ramp southbound. So depending, and sometimes your CAD system may put it in one way, and your GIS may be something different. So you want to try to get those to match up the best you can. Right. All right, so, so th thank you for the questions, guys. Keep them coming. We love them. Yeah, definitely. So parcel placement in the centroid, what's really great about the site structure address point document is it, give you, it gives you advantages and disadvantages for every type of point placement. And for me as a user and being on this work group, it was very helpful for me because if we didn't have standards or we were creating how we were gonna do these things for our municipalities, this would be a good place to start. This is something I could take to my addressing meetings and say, okay, this is how I place your points now. Here are some advantages, disadvantages. Here are some other options. Let's, let's work through these and we decide as a collective group and that's gonna be how we do it from now on and that's how we're gonna document it. Because for example, if you're looking at the screen now, do you see the parcel at the very bottom and you see the house the address point is close to where the cul-de-sac is. Well, is that really where the house is? And how does the responder access that property if that's an address? Same thing with the kind of the L-shaped one. Is the house really on the backside behind two other houses? So making it realistic, you know, because that's what the responders are going to see in the field. Okay, actual versus potential when it comes to geocoding ranges. So I kind of talked about you have a 100 to 198 across the street on the odd side, 101 to 199. But if you notice the address ranges are 133 to 167 and 136 to 170. So some places use potential ranges, some people use actual. And that's a decision you have to make within your jurisdiction, how you want to do it. And whatever you decide to do, you want to be consistent across the board. So the CLDXF standard from Nina, um, very really good document, really good document, very long document. <laughs> okay, you're going to spend some time, and you kind of have to, you kind of have to eat it in pieces, like how you eat an elephant one piece at a time. It's a lot to devolve, to to disseminate, and to take in all at one time. But some of the really important parts about this document, it talks about the core civic location data elements that are needed to support emergency call routing and dispatch. And that's what we're going to when we go to next gen, how we're going to route the calls and how these calls are going to be dispatched. It goes into depth about PIDA flow, the presence information data format location object. And it talks about the different groups like Nina and Eurissa that sponsored these standards. So it's really, really important, but it also goes into addressing parsing. And that's what we're gonna talk about, parsing your data. So in next gen, like currently, if you look at your MSAG or even in your GIS fields, for your street name, it's all in one field in a lot of places still to this day. For next gen, we're gonna be breaking it out into different elements. 
So for the street name, it's going to be broken into eight street name elements. And you're already thinking, oh my gosh, that's a whole lot for a street name. Well, let's give you some examples to kind of put it in perspective. Uh, alternate in the, in the row name, alternate root eight would be, alternate would become what they call a pre-modifier. It's not really part of the street name, it's before the street name, which would be root in this case, or root eight. The pre-directional, pretty common. We're used to pre-directionals, right? But in next gen, they're going to be spelled out. It's not going to be N for north, S for south, southeast, et cetera. The street name pre-type, and this is one I was very thankful that they came up with because I had a lot of these, where you have like a street name called Avenue A. Well, Avenue is really a street type or a street suffix. But in this case, it's going to become a pre-type for the street name. Or county root 88 would be county root would be the pre-type. Another one I was very happy about is the pre-type separator. I know in North Carolina, there's an avenue of the Carolinas. Well, of the really doesn't fit anywhere. So it's going to have its own field now called the pre-type separator. Street name, pretty easy to figure out for most of us. Post type. So that's going to be your avenue, street, drive, boulevard. And in next gen, they're not going to be abbreviated. They're going to be spelled out. Because I know in a lot of CAD systems, they may use AV, where postal standard says use AVE. So that causes confusion. In this case, it'll be pretty standard as long as the CAD vendor will be able to use it as well and disseminate it and suck it in. Uh, Post-directional, again, it's going to be pretty easy. We're used to these, but you got to spell it out. Hey, Mark. So yes, for so for the full street name for like Avenue A, will that have to be split out? So is Avenue A the street name? Well, and there you might have to do some research on some of your street names to find out, is that really part of the street name or not? So you may have to go back to the original plat, the original uh, legal description of that street name. Yeah, so, so in this case, Avenue A is the street name. So I would imagine per the parsing requirements, uh, your street name field would have Avenue A in it. And then if you had, uh, if that's Avenue A drive, drive would be your post height. Um, if you had any directionals, they would fall in your pre or post directional. Um, but as far as pre-type separator, I don't know if like in this instance, if Avenue A is your street name, you wouldn't have a pre-type or a pre-type separator, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the that's a hard, really, that's a really hard one, though, guys. It is. Um, some of these are going to require you to actually put some thought into. Um, and as Mark said, do a little bit of research. Yeah, you can't just go through the system and go, okay, everything that starts with Avenue, move it over here. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's you're going to break something don't really bad. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, the post modifier is a really good example of one that I've seen in a lot of places when I've looked at M sides and alleys. They use the word extended at the end of the street name. So avenue is the street post type or the street suffix, right? But extended didn't really fit anywhere. Uh, sometimes you see th something called like an extension. Well, that's a street type as well or street suffix. So extended is a lot of times they'll have a street that runs east and west. It stops here at this intersection, but now they're going to add on and add a new subdivision. They just extend the road instead of giving it a new street name. And that's okay. But we really didn't have a place for this extended part to go in. Yeah. So and those Mark, are the, go ahead. So we, so ju just, just so we make sure we're not confusing folks on this with pre-type, pre-type separator and street name. For the example that we just talked about with Avenue A, which was a question that came in from someone, um, because Avenue A is the street name in that example, um, if you could trace it back to the original plat and see that that's how it was originally platted, um, Avenue would not be as pre-type in that example. But if you have, so here's an example of a street when I was back at the county that we got a request for. It was for, um, it was for Ave Maria, right? So it's, <laughs> It's a really bad street name. I hope nobody's got a street name. It's Ave. It was Ave Maria Avenue, I think is what they wanted to call it. So it was A-V-E Maria A-V-E. So in that example, the first 
Ave may be a pre-type separator or maybe a pre-type or a pre-type separator if it's not part of the street name that would be Ave Maria, right? So it, it can be confusing, but don't let Avenue or County Rail or of the um, get you confused. Go back to the original documentation and determine and define what the street name is. Right. Right. And then don't get confused with like North Main Street. North is a pre directional in that instance, not a pre type or pre type separator. Right. That one's a little easier. Um, I want to say it may be rare that you see this stuff, but we know it happens. Mm -hmm. um, it can be confusing with the pre-types and the pre-type separators. Um, Avenue is probably a bad example, like Avenue of the Americas. Avenue is the pre-type, of the is the pre-type separator, which would make the street name Americas. Americas, right. Right? So I see where the confusion could come in. Um, it's a hard one. It's a really hard one. And I don't know that we can, that we can go through every example on this time. But um, feel free to give us a shout or shoot us an email. We can have an in-depth conversation with you guys and give us your examples and we can help walk you through the examples that you have and make sure that, that you're understanding it correctly. There you go. I hope that helps. Um, it is confusing, but it is something that we can get through. Yep. And then for next gen, they also broke out the address, address number elements. So you can have something like an address number prefix, like in Hawaii, they use five dash and a, and a four or five digit number. So the five dash would be part of the address number prefix. Then you have your address number, which is your actual house number. So in my case, it's 406 for my house. Address number suffix. I know in St. Petersburg, Florida, where I worked in Pinellas County, they ran out of addresses because back in the day, they would assign 100, 102, 104, 106, 108. Well, then they would break the parcel at 100 and put two houses on there. Well, they, they didn't have an address to put on there, so they just started using one half. Well, you can do that, but you just need to move it to a separate field. So you're putting it in a suffix field. And then there's an optional one where you can actually put a mile post, like that mile marker we talked about a little while ago, can be used in place of or in addition to the address number. So you can have four separate fields for your addresses. So I know in like Wisconsin, they like to use letters like M or W or E as part of their house numbers. And sometimes they even have leading zeros. That would move into the address number prefix field. And then sub address elements, really important when it comes to sub addressing. So in next gen, we're gonna be able to really delve down all the way to the seat level. So we'll be able to use building, like building A, um, additional location, like the west wing of the White House, uh, the floor, like at a hotel may have a mezzanine level or a lobby level. The unit number could be an apartment, suite, unit. A room, you can actually narrow it down to room level, and you can even go as far as a cubicle or seat level, especially at a big business complex. Now these sub address elements are awesome if you're a responder and you're a dispatcher and you tell a responder, you're going to this building, this floor, this unit, this room, this seat. That's pretty specific, right? The only problem is how do you maintain this information? What if, a, what if it's a strip plaza and you have five different units in this strip plaza with one address and the owner decides to split one of those units into two units? and rent two out instead of one, but they never tell anybody. We may not know it's been broken out or what if a cube moves or a room number moves, they sub subdivide that room into two different rooms. So the information's good, but it's only as good as, it, as it's maintained or verified. Okay, so Nina has an ESB working group that's been working pretty much most of the year. And it's all part of the next gen GIS data model process. So it gives a little explanation here on what this data stewardship group is doing. And I happen to be part of this group and it's been really, really informational. We're still working on the document. 
Uh, but just be aware that we're, we're always trying to make the standards and the information documents and the requirement documents more usable for you, more understandable, more applicable for what you're doing. So just let you know, changes are always coming. I know a new model of the GIS data model will be coming out. Uh, documents get released for public view. So look, take time and look at these documents and give your input because we can't use examples from all over the US if we don't have everyone on the call from all over the US. And we also try to incorporate Canadian and Mexican in Mexico because they're using these kind of things too with Nina as well. Because Nina is not just in the US, it's international as well. Then there's another document about the GIS data stewardship for next gen. And this one talks a lot about the PSAP boundaries. And PSAP boundaries are something Drew's gonna talk about, how that's one of the required boundaries, but it talks about the initial development, how to modify, how to refine, and of course, long-term maintenance. Because once you draw your boundary, it's not a one and done thing. Your PSAP boundary may change as you annex different properties. Or maybe they put a new fire station in and another fire department's gonna cover this area where normally they wouldn't because their response time is faster. So if you haven't looked at this one, this one's a good document to look at. All right, Drew, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about some stuff. All right, guys, thanks. Hey, the questions that are coming in, I'm trying to type them out as fast as I can. Some of this stuff we will address here in what's kind of the second part of this presentation. First part, you saw we really focused a lot on the standards. Um, the questions related to the standards are also marked. I don't know if you want to read through those and see if you can answer some, because some are really going to pertain more to you um, and your expertise from that side. Great questions, though, guys. I see them. We're going to knock them out as fast as we can, either live or we're gonna type them out for you guys. All right, so as we get into the GIS conversation, we wanna relate GIS and what we're doing in GIS back to the standards that you just learned. Well, first, you know, we, we need to go through the required GIS data layers for next gen 911. So your PSAT boundaries, your road center lines, your emergency service boundaries, your address points and your provisioning boundaries. But, and we do this um, because we know we're moving into a uh, geospatial car routing component for next gen 911, which is using our highly accurate GIS data to perform car routing and location validation. Right, so we're really going to focus heavily on boundaries and address points for this presentation, but I did want to give you kind of an overview with this slide of what the requirements are in case you did not already know. And most of you are already know that I already know that you know this, so this is kind of a, a repeat for you. All right, next slide for me, Mark. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to type answers at the same yeah, time. Yeah, no, right. It's, it's a lot of good questions in there. It is. All right, so right, so we identified that our address points are a required data set. It's our most precise um, data layer for our resource routing and our location identification. We know that it's structure based, and as we're moving into the next gen 911 environment. We know sub-addressing is going to play a bigger role for us and is really going to change a little bit on how GIS professionals are managing sub-addressing data for your address points in your GIS. And as we've already discussed, this can include non-addressed dispatchable locations like bridges, like cell phone towers, um, wastewater stations, pump stations, electric substations, anything that you can think of that you might want to give an address to and be creative with that, but also make sure it makes sense, right? You don't wanna go through your entire database and give an address to every water valve or every turn off valve that you have in your data. That may be a little overkill, but I know in places I've worked, we addressed all of our fire hydrants. So that may be something that you decide to do. And then determine whether or not that, that data specific to something that's a non-address dispatchable location lives in your structure address layer or lives in a separate layer that you can reference. Um, careful how you do that because it's also gonna determine how you maintain both of those layers or how you maintain that single layer if you're doing it as one layer. Next, Mark. All right, sub-addressing. So sub-addressing I told you guys is new, but it's the process of identifying, it's not really new, but it's a new way to kind of look at this data. It's the process of identifying multi-unit structures to share a common mailing address 
with a unique identifier. We see sub-addressing occur a lot in apartment complexes, colleges and universities, shopping centers, big hospital complexes, anything that you might look at and say, that's a campus, predominantly is gonna have a single mailing address and each individual building, um, if it's a campus, a uh, college campus or university or military installation, may be identified by a name, but not an address number using any kind of addressing theory or addressing logic. And we run into some issues with that when we get into 911. Um, typically with visitors on campuses, they generally don't know where they are. They know that they're at Smith Building and more times than not, you have um, qualified individuals that are working at 911 that know where Smith Building is because they grew up in the area and they just know where it is. But you can see where it would get hard. Now, from a data maintenance standpoint, I've given you an example of an attribute table and how you may want to consider managing your sub addressing in your attribute data. So if you'll notice over where it says address is about mid part of the table, we have uh, 489 Water Avenue, or you go to your label and you see um, 527A Woodside Street. That's typically how I've managed data, sub addressing data. I would have my alphanumeric value as a part of my house number. Well, for next generation 911, we're, we're, we're separating those two. So our house number is going to be by itself. Uh, the data is parsed, by the way, if you're looking at the attribute table. You have your address number. It's just the, the 527, your full name for your street, Woodside Street. You split those out to your name with Woodside and street is your type. We don't have any um, pre-directionals or post-directionals. We don't have any post modifiers. The full name as it would be is 427 Woodside Street. We might label it to help us just visually identify that there's multiple units with that 527A. But then I have a field in my attribute table that's sub -named. Right, and it's got my alphanumeric values in there to identify multiple units. We did get a question in here. What happens if your unit name is Jones, right? It's not an alphanumeric value, like an A, a B, a C, or a one, two, or a three. It's an actual name. Mark, I would imagine that name would go in that subfield, right? Yes. Right, so yes. If it's a sub address and it's used to identify, uniquely identify a specific unit as a part of a multi unit complex, that's where that information would go. And this is a part of the NG911 data model, if you guys are familiar with that. It's already built in that for you. Next slide for me. All right, and then our boundary data. Boundary data is required. Um, primary piece that boundary is your extent that your PSAP covers. You need footprints to match your neighbors. So we don't want any gaps, overlaps, or duplicate polygons. And when we talk about boundary data for next generation 911, let's go ahead and identify that there's three layers that we were focusing on. Our PSAP boundary, which is what we're discussing here, our emergency service boundaries, which we'll get to a little later, and our provisioning boundary, which is right after that. Um, it's important to work with your neighbors when you're developing or reviewing any of these boundary layers because we want to identify early in the process that there's gaps overlaps duplicate polygons or multi-part polygons so if you look at the example at the center of your screen the screen at the top you see all these slivers of data that's in there we want to eliminate that stuff because that that'll produce a gap or an overlap within our polygon area and we don't want that and then if you look down to the, to the bottom right, you see another sliver there. You also see a multi-part polygon. So we also want to make sure that those lines are continuous. They're not multi-part. And we don't have slivers that are sitting on top of or below our main boundary line that we're working with. We know that this stuff, it, you know, throughout history can be chopped up, can be moved around, accidents can happen. Let's go ahead and verify that stuff now before we get too deep into this next gen kind this next gen 911 conversation and we're starting to use that data to do routing um what will happen is is you insert that data into your your next gen 911 environment your ESI net environment you're going to get a return of something not working so you're going to get an error report and you're going to have to go fix it 
So let's fix it before we get to that point. We're going to, we're going to talk about some ways that we can do that. Next slide for me. And then our provisioning boundary defines the area of GIS data that we're provisioning. So the, the area of data responsibility that's ours, you as the primary piece out. It's also important to note that as we're moving into the next gen 911 world, your 911 administrator becomes the responsible party for all of the GIS data being used or provisioned to the ESINET for next generation 911. So if you are in GIS and you're you sit outside of the PSAP, start having these conversations early with the folks at your PSAP. Or if you're a GIS person that sits in your PSAP, make sure you're having conversations internally and externally to identify these boundaries early. So the, the provisioning boundary must be agreed upon with all adjoining data provisioning providers. So for each primary PSAP, we're gonna have a provisioning boundary. More than likely, this is going to be very similar to your county boundary or your municipal boundary. Just make sure there's no gaps or overlaps between you and your neighbors. This is probably the easiest boundary to create because it's just saying all of the data that's in this polygon, we're responsible for fixing and maintaining. That's it. It's not being used to drive call routing or dispatch routing. And also where the provisioning boundary comes into play is the discrepancy reports that come out of the ESI net. We use the provisioning boundary to understand where it goes so that it be remediated fixed. Right, so this determines the entity responsible for completing discrepancy resolutions, just told you that. Think of it as like a geofence for the spatial interface and identifying what data is where and who it belongs to and who's responsible for maintaining it. All right, then our next slide, we're going to talk about the emergency service boundaries. Um, there's, there can be some confusion with this boundary layer because I know a lot of you guys already have your ESZs or your ESNs, your emergency service zones or your emergency service number layers, right? Where you have one polygon layer and throughout there, it's identifying where law, police, EMS are going to respond to. The big change with NextGen is those need to be split out into three separate layers. Right? So you're going to have a layer for your law enforcement that can be subdivided based on beats right? inside that one layer. You're going to have your fire layer that can be subdivided out between your engine company response, your first response, and then your EMS layer. So within each of those individual polygons, you can't have any gaps or overlaps, especially if you're identifying beats or first response areas. So no gaps or overlaps between those. And then as you layer them on top of each other, they can't overlap, obviously, because they're layers. You also want to work with your neighbors to ensure if this subdivision that splits our boundary is my responsibility, that my ESB boundary accounts for that. Because I'm going to be first due response to that area while the county that that portion of data sits in and they may be responsible for is going to be second due. That's where ESVs get really interesting and can be really difficult. Um, so try not to get too confused. Think about these one at a time. Don't try and think about them all together and how you're going to just tackle that beast as a whole. So break out law enforcement, identify how you want to identify your beats or how you want to identify your response areas. Draw those out, validate them, check the topology, check with your neighbors, make sure it's good, and then move to fire, then move to EMS or whatever your order is, right? So these can take a while because it requires more people at the table to identify the area. It's not something that can be done in a vacuum. And it's also not a GIS problem. And when I say that, this means that your 911 administrator or for someone from dispatch can't just go to GIS and say, hey, make these layers. Some of the decisions that have to be made can be made based on MOUs that are already in place. And GIS may or may not know about those MOUs, right? Also, GIS may or may not be privy to information regarding first due or second due response areas to localities that sit outside of your county boundary that you may need to pull them into the conversation to have. So get GIS involved early with the creation of emergency service boundaries 
but understand your 911 folks and your public safety folks are going to help make the decisions on where those lines get drawn. Also, make sure you have your neighbors at the table when you're having these discussions, or at some point, you have your neighbors involved in the conversation to review placement of these boundaries. All right, next for me, Mark. Perfect, all right, data validations, extremely important. So the document that I have referenced at the bottom is the NG911 data management requirements document. Check that document out. Is it, it is extremely valuable. It is going to give you a ton of information. I have some highlighted and some high level stuff picked out here, but validate, validating your data is important. So when we say data validations, what does that mean? Well, first we wanna to check to ensure that the maintenance of our data remains at a high level for accuracy, completeness, and synchronization. Because what we don't wanna happen is we don't wanna take all of our GIS data, provision it to the ASINET, and get all of these discrepancy reports back. If I can pre-validate my data, which is a, um, a suggestion from Nina. And so Nina, by the way, is the Emergency Number Association, who is, so Nina and NextGen 911 are not interchangeable. They're two separate pieces. Nina, the National Emergency Number Association, is kind of the governing body of everything that goes on with 911. And Next Generation 911, is not new technology, but it's a it's a re it's kind of a rebuild of our 911 system. It's a new infrastructure. It's an IP based infrastructure. We're also using GIS data to help make decisions. So we did get a question earlier if they were interchangeable, and I thought I'd just kind of bring that up now because it's kind of relevant to the conversation. But so this document. You need to go check it out. Nina, Nina is encouraging localities and 911 authorities to perform quality assurance, quality control checks prior to provisioning data to the, to the spatial interface or the ESINET. And they cite some examples in that document, invalid geometry, duplicate attribution, address range issues on center line, or malformed uniform resource identifier URI, malformed URI. Don't look at that document and say, all right, here's all my validations that I need to check. Address range issues on center line could be 15 different validation checks, right? So what they're citing are examples of things that you could start looking for. Things you can start looking for now in your GIS office, invalid geometries, you can look for that. You can look for gaps and overlaps. You can look for duplicate attribution, but understand you're scratching the surface that you may need to go deeper. And there are ways to do that, and we're going to talk about them here a little bit. All right, so next, Mark, I'm going to show you some examples of some validations. Um, also, CAD validations versus validations for next generation 911. Some of you guys are looking at yourself, you're like, we already do validations, we're good. If you are focused just on CAD validations, you're missing a whole lot of information. So with CAD, we're really just looking to compare tabular data set to tabular data. So our attribute table and our GIS data versus the tabular data that is our MSAG and our alley, right? Are we matching one-to-one? -one? So 1213 North Main Street is over here. Is that also over here? All right, good. What are you missing from that though? Is it spatially accurate? Is that point actually sitting on that location? Is it misordered along the road center line? Or are my attributes lining up, right? So are my street name that I have in one, does it match the street name I have in the other? The same with the street type or sub addressing. So CAD doesn't pick that up because CAD is primarily used for post-call decision-making or resource routing or dispatch, right? Your CAD map that you have up, call comes in, you identify a location, you can pull your map up, you may have GIS data in there, you can help you can help a responder get to where they need to go. Well, with NextGen 911, we're looking beyond the table. We want to look spatially as the data accurate. Our points, our lines, our polygons, our topology, does it all make sense? Is it logical? That's what we're checking for because we're using this as a pre-call decision-making process for NextGen 911, which is our geospatial call routing, identifying where to send the call. If our GIS data is wrong, the call may not go to the right place. All right, next for me, Mark.
went too far. That's okay. So, so as, as you heard me just preach, validations aren't just tabular, they're also spatial. So when we're looking at our road, our road centerline data to our MSAG and our alley, um, is what's in GIS also exists in the MSAG? Do address ranges match? Are we theoretical versus real? Are road names consistent? Road name spelling, you, you wouldn't believe, but people are human and people make mistakes and can fat finger letters and numbers in when we're doing our data entry. So we want to check for that. Road types, are they abbreviated or spelled out? For next year 911, it will have to be spelled out, but I know for some CADs, you can't do that. You need an abbreviation. So this is where you would identify if you need to have a separate row in your attribute table to account for the abbreviated street type versus the spelled out street type. And then when we're comparing our address points to our alley document, do the address points fall within the road range? Is there a one-to-one -one match? How does our sub addressing look or do we even have it? If we don't have our sub addressing, have we created a ton of duplicate address points that we need to address? And then which is more accurate for making my decisions? Is it my alley, my AMSAG, or my GIS? This is an important, a very important question because it's gonna help you make the decision of which document is going to be your master and help dictate potential changes that you'll make to the other, other documents. If you're extremely confident in your GIS, but know that your MSAC has been manipulated so much over the years, you've kind of lost trust in it, then maybe you use GIS to help facilitate changes that you would make in your MSAC. I hope that makes sense. It's a really important question that you need to ask yourself and determine which is better. All right, next one, Mark. All right, so before you get started with all of these data validations and start looking at your data, I have this up here just to point out, you need to have some sense of order to what you're doing. Um, this is going to ensure that you don't create error or interject error while you're fixing something that you know is wrong. So as a suggestion or a best practice, compare your MSAG to your road centerline data first and identify anomalies that exist there. And then work to correct or remediate those errors first before you start looking at your address points. Your boundary creation, that's something that you can start in tandem with your data validations between your GIS, your, your MSAG, and your alley. Um, you want to normalize the data. So you want to remediate any anomalies that you found within your road center line or your MSAG when you've done that comparison. And then throw in your address points. Compare your alley records to your GIS and identify anomalies that exist there and then work through fixing those. The problem we run into is we typically want to fix the low hanging fruit first, but that might not be the best order. If we identify an anomaly within our address points, it's misordered, it's on the wrong side of the road center line, or it falls outside of a road range, we have a, we have a tendency to want to jump in and fix that first. But inadvertently, what you may do is create more error because we need to think about how we derive our address number or our house number off of that road segment. It starts with the road. So fix anomalies within your street segments first, revalidate your data, and then identify errors that exist in your road center line. And then maintenance. Maintenance is an extremely important part of this process because you're going to spend a ton of time getting the data where it needs to be for next gen make sure you maintain it, right? Develop a validation process that can become part of your maintenance process. So as you add new subdivisions in, as you add in new changes, revalidate to make sure it still fits what you need it to fit to support next gen 911, as well as your other business practices in your locality. All right, next one we work. We're probably gonna fly through these next few slides. Um, so fish bones, fish bones are something that, that we do for you guys that really help us identify where a point would fall on a road segment to know if we're consistent with our address ranges and the addresses that we've addressed off of that segment. What we wanna see is what you see over on the left, it's right, it's more perpendicular, almost looks like a rib cage or bones, right? Fish bones, makes sense. Um, we know there, there are errors that exist. When you start seeing things cross, or you see multiple lines coming out of a single point, which could reference, um, wrong address ranges, bad street names, inconsistent street names, right? It's just visually a way for us to see that errors exist here. We need to dive deeper. 
And this is something that, that we perform for you guys if we do a validation check for you. We also provide you the capability to create these yourself. Next for me, Mark. Then we're going to get to some examples, duplicate address points. I'm not going to go real deep here. Um, I know we've only got five minutes left, so I'm going to rush a little bit. Um, duplicate address points, more often than not, are related to sub addressing. So check sub addressing, work to eliminate duplication, or work to eliminate duplicate address points. Sub addressing most of the time can fix that. Next. All right, an address point that's not reflected in a road center line. So you see we have Michael's Way that's highlighted right in the center of your screen. And then you have 180 Michael's Way sitting over there off the right. No fish bone, so they're not connected. So there's an error. So what we do is we look at our attribution for our street, for our road center line and our address point. And we see that in the attribute table for our road center line, the street name is Michael's Way. But in our address point layer, the street name is Michael and the street type is walk. So I said way, so it's walk. So there's an inconsistency there. We would want to determine is Michael's walk the street name? If it is, those need to match. If walk is the street type, then I need to make sure it's consistent between my address points and my road center lines. And I see that I cut the bottom of that attribute table off. I'm sorry, guys. All right, next for me, Mark. All right, topology checks. A lot of times you need to run topology checks if you have the ability to do so, because some of the stuff you're just not going to see. Overshoots and undershoots can be very small that you have to zoom in at almost one to one, not one to 5,000 or one to 10,000 to see it. Right? So most common, that's what we see when we produce a validation check for you guys. We'll see undershoots and overshoots that require you to zoom way in to see it, to fix it. It's a simple fix, but sometimes it may exist as you see in the example for the overshoot, where it's crossing, that segment's not split. So you may need to split that segment and then pull that point to your new snap point or your new node, which means now you're splitting an address range. So this is where you can create error while trying to fix something. Be cognizant of what's going on. If you have to split a road segment to fix an overshoot or an undershoot, or two road center lines that are crossing, if they need to be split, understand what goes into the mechanics of that. Over on the right, you see self-intersecting road center line. That's a single segment that intersects back on itself. It's a simple fix. You would just want to split that road somewhere to make it two parts, two segments, right? <coughs> Excuse me. But if you don't know to look for that, then you're not going to see it just looking at your road center line data. You can see that we have this symbolized with arrows at the end of the road to help us determine uh, digitized flow of road, which could be an error. If you have roads that are digitized into the, uh, into the other, it's going to generate an anomaly. So think about some of these things as you get into it and think about how you may check for some of these topology checks. All right, next for me, sir. Over, overshoot or gaps and overlaps, you have to check for this stuff, guys. Um, whether you do it uh, via topology rules, you use us to run an analysis for you, you purchase tools that help you do this as a validation engine, whatever. Um, layer the stuff, make sure you can see through and see there's gap overlap. Some of this stuff, if it's internal to your boundary, you'll be able to fix it, no problem. But if it involves your neighbors, you can't fix it without bringing your neighbors to the table. So that's why it's important for us to constantly look for gaps and overlaps, because it's going to determine who we bring to the table. And this also impacts call routing. Because if you call from a gap or an overlap, the system doesn't know where to send the call. So it reverts back to legacy call routing, which is the triangulation, figuring out where to go. And it still may be the wrong place. So that's why gaps and overlaps are important to eliminate from your data. All right, next for me, Mark. I, I feel pushed against the clock, brother. All right, so reconciling data is extremely important as life critical. So I'm going to start at the bottom of this slide because this is really important. Error resolution. So Nina requires data error resolution be within three business days. So from the time an anomaly is found within your spatial interface, when that uh, anomaly report or that discrepancy report is generated, you have three, three business days to fix that. That's a lot, and it can be a lot depending on the type of anomaly. Um, we won't go into much detail 
tell you what, if you want to talk about that more, give me a call. I've got a great conversation for you. But know that that's um, a requirement that is in documentation. So the idea is to try and get to 98% synchronization and beyond. So beyond 98%. You guys have probably heard about 98%. Getting to 98% in itself does not produce public safety grade GIS data because we're not looking at gaps and overlaps. We're not looking at road center line breaks. We're not looking at duplicate address points. We're only looking at tabular data to make sure it's a one-to-one -one match between our GIS or MSAG and our alley, and those are synchronized. That's from a 2008 or 2009 informational document that has been pulled over. 2009 that has been pulled over as kind of a a shoot for goal for next gen 911, but know that it's not enough. We got to go deeper. That's why we have to get into the spatial comparisons. We've got to look at our fish bones. Um, it has to be cyclical. It's got to be part of our maintenance process so that that data stays at a high level. All right, next four remark. And then da the data maintenance workflow. I love this slide, guys, because it shows that developing that workflow early is going to ensure that your data stays at that high level, right? So creating that data package, if you have a validation engine, so this is where we want to start, that validation engine. This is something that, that we provide as a solution. There are also others in the market that do it, but we're not going to talk about theirs. We'll talk about ours, right? Run your validations. You can pull down out of the platform a markup table that shows you where the anomalies are as a point, a line, or a polygon so that you know immediately where to go to fix them. You're not getting a report that says, 12% of your data has duplicate address points. Great, what can I do with that? How do I find them? That markup table is gonna show you where they are and give you, the, give you the ability to go in and say, yes, this is wrong, I need to fix this, or mark it as an exception because you know it's never gonna get fixed, right? An address point that's misordered along the road center line or is on the opposite side of the road, but it's a historic manner, you're never gonna change the address for that. Market is an exception and move on. You're good to go on the ESINet, right? But it provides you the ability to review and fix what you need to, or mark as an exception, <coughs> excuse me, and then put back into the validation engine or provision back into your ESINet to keep going. So it's cyclical. It never stops. It's a part of your, your maintenance routine. It needs to get built out as your, as your data maintenance workflow. All right, Mark. This is fun. This has been a good one. All right, so, so some of the things that, that we provide as an organization, as a company for you guys, we do have a, a SaaS software platform. It's called VEP, Validate Edit Provision. So it's your validation engine. It's your, it can be your editor platform. If you are looking for a platform to edit GIS and maintain your GIS data in, it's also the provisioning platform that allows you to push that data into your ESINet. Um, we have in our YouTube channel some demos on VEP, or if you'd like to learn more about VEP, let me know. We also have some other services, like an address comparison and evaluation process, where we work with you guys to collect five or six addressing data sets to compare and look for potentially a missing address points. Um, we always find something. The most we have ever found um, for a locality out in California that had a, about 180,000 address points to start with, we ran an ACE and found, I think around 150 or 160 potential candidates. So that's significant. Think about what that's gonna do for improved response, as well as your tax rate, your tax base. So your assessors are gonna love it that you found new address points and your responders are gonna love it because they now have accurate representation of reality and can respond. If you need help working with your boundaries or developing your boundaries and working with your neighbors, we can help facilitate that for you guys as well. Um, a lot of our clients do that. It lets us be the guy that's trying to get the meetings together and set the emails up and the calls. It works out really well for, for, for the clients that have done it. Um, so ACE, we can do implementation planning for you guys. If you're wanting to build an implementation plan, that is something we can come in and help you with. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about the software platform or any of the services that we provide, we can help create data for you guys or even come in and fix your data for you. 
run the run the validations, identify the anomalies in your GIS data. We can be staff augmentation for you guys and help help get you where you need to be. Um, and that's we can also provide education. So we provide a ton of stuff like this at no cost as well, but the software and services is going to come with the cost. Next for me, Mark. All right, some key features. Think, think, I love this quote. Um, VEP is work from home approved, right? So nobody was thinking about working from home because of the global pandemic when they picked this um, Manatee County, Florida picked VEP. But they're so glad they had a cloud-based solution that allowed them to execute work during a pandemic. Um, I know the pandemic has affected everybody differently and we've all had to adapt in some capacity. But for these guys, having a platform that was in the cloud that could work from anywhere you are, as long as you have an internet connection, proved very valuable for Manatee County. Um, they've been a lot of fun to work with. Next one we work. All right, finally got here. I'm six minutes over, guys. Super apologize for that. Um, here's our contact information. Um, please do not hesitate to send me an email, send me a call. Same for Mark. We're more than happy to go deeper into these conversations, um, show you guys different things. Um, but I don't want to close out yet because I see a lot of questions. Um, I, I saved one for you, Drew. I was typing as fast as I could. But if, if the new requirement is a separate layer for law, fire, and EMS for the boundaries, ESBs, how do we handle some fire districts that also perform EMS duties? So if, if, their, if their response area is the same, it'll be a duplicate polygon. Just one will be labeled EMS and one will be layered fire. Right. So you still want to account for that because they may, in some instances, they may dispatch fire and EMS, or they may just dispatch fire or EMS. Right. So we want to make sure we account for it. Um, even if it's a do, even if it's a duplication of that polygon, being in a separate layer, it's not going to identify it as a duplicate. Does that make sense? All right. What else we got? Um, we have a sub that was platted in the 60s. It was never developed. <coughs> now a new, new owner is selling lots. The road name on the original plats are very generic. Um, I use the plat road names, but added SLE to the beginning. So what's great about property that comes up for sale is it gives you an opportunity to correct things that you need to correct. Um, as you get into validating your data for next gen 911, whether you contact me and say, Drew, I'd like to get a validation done to see what I'm working with. Call me. I'm going to do that for you. We're going to take care of that. And as you see some things in there that you know aren't going to change, like an address point that's misordered or an address point that's on the opposite side of the road, um, you may initially mark that as an exception because you know the process to change an address can, be, can create a lot of heartache. And I've done it and I'm aware of it. And I understand what you're going through anytime you have to do that. So market is an exception, but keep a note because if that property ever, com ever comes up for sale, change the address at time of sale. That's the perfect time to change it. Exactly. For this, with the road names that are generic, you may look at doing that. If one, is it a developed subdivision right now? Um, if it's developed and it's been developed for a while, it may be a little harder to change the names. Um, but you can always look back and say it's a 911 issue. If you need to go to your city council or some, some oversight board and it's something that you want to get changed because it's going to help with response, you can always lean on 911 for that. I love my 911 folks from the GIS office because I can always say, hey, is this a 911 issue? If they said, yep, we're good to go to the next step. Love it. <clears throat> Can a pre-type be used to define an area of roads? Mm, I'm going to say no, because what we really want to do is try and identify features individually. So um, it's not related to roads, but it is related to point data. You'll see a lot of people using a site point to identify a park or a campground where it's a single point that's either at ingress, egress to the property or it sits in the center of the property that says, this is Jack Smithfield campground. 
So they're using that point to identify an area that is related, but then they they further identify it by coming back with structure points for each cabin, if there's cabins, or they'll have a point for each campsite where they're using sub addressing to identify the site. Um, I'd love to I'd love to connect with you and give me an example of what you're talking about because I, I can only think of roads that may be in a subdivision or some sort of industrial complex that you want to group together is Bartfield Smith Industrial Complex. All of these roads are in that maybe. Um, it's an interesting question. Um, because in this case, it is part of the base name of the street, not a, uh, that's a, not a question. So I love this question. Um, is anyone working on something similar to this project from Australia? using recurrent neural networks to put the various parts of the address into the various name elements. I have no clue. I have a ton of friends in Australia. Um, if somebody knows if Australia is working towards what the United States would call next gen 911 compliance, let me know. Um, it would be cool to connect with those guys to figure out what they're, what they're going through and some of the challenges they're going through. All right, and then just, 360 degree panoramic figure. So does 360 degree panoramic figure into the next gen 911 data plans in the future? No clue. Um, <laughs> I, have a, I have a guess that one day we will be in 3D environments and panoramic views will be leveraged usefully. Um, as we start exploring indoor mapping more, as we start in, exploring standards for z value accuracy you could see 3 3d panoramic play a bigger role um right now man we're, we're we're such at the beginning levels right now of exploring change to a system that's 50 years old right um could it happen sure is it happening anytime soon no should you start thinking about a Z level accuracy within a couple of years? Absolutely. All right, and I think I went through all of the questions, Mark. I think so. I was typing like a banshee. <laughs> I know, but hey guys, this was great interaction. I love yeah, it. It was. Um, so I hope we answered all your questions. If you left with anything unanswered, please call me right now. This is my cell phone number. It will ring right here and I will pick it up. And we will have a conversation. Um, keep a lookout tomorrow for a follow-up email. We'll send an email out with a link to the recording. We'll send you a copy of the slide deck so that you guys have it for everybody that registered. We'll get it. Um, and don't be surprised if myself or Mark reach out to you individually look for some feedback. The only way we can make these better is if you guys let us know where we need to improve. Um, with that, I'm going to say, guys, thanks. We kept you almost 15 minutes over. I do apologize for that, but the questions coming in were too valuable not to not to answer. Exactly. Um, thank you for your interaction. Thank you for your participation and Absolutely. hanging out with us. We really enjoy it. So Thank you guys for taking your Tuesday afternoon for about an hour and 15 minutes and hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. Um, let, let's get you set up with a demo. I'd love to show you the product. I'd love to do a data assessment for you. Um, so for, for the folks that are, that are tuning off right now, you won't hear this, but if anybody would like to have a conversation about what goes into a data assessment, shoot me an email, give me a call. It's a very easy process. We'll get you set, we'll get you going. And um, yeah, looking forward to connecting with you guys. If we don't talk, have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Stay yes. safe and come check us out in January for our next monthly webinar. Guys, y'all have a great day. Take care.